Antibiotics are miracle drugs. When penicillin was first discovered almost a century ago, many previously fatal infections were almost magically rendered curable. For example, infection of heart valves, termed infective endocarditis, almost universally fatal before the advent of antibiotics, became curable in many cases. Antibiotics provide life-saving treatment for sepsis and bacterial infections of the lung, termed pneumonia, central nervous system, and bones and joints, just to name a few infection types. They're like wishes delivered by a genie released from a lamp. They enable us to carry out complex medical and surgical procedures such as cancer chemotherapy, joint replacement surgery, and organ transplantation that might otherwise be complicated by devastating infections. Because antibiotics are wonder drugs, their use is imperative. Why would we deny magical treatment? They've therefore become widely used in medicine. But did you know they're also widely used in our pets? And they're widely used to raise the fish and other animals as well as crops that we eat, and even to grow the flowers that we enjoy. In short, antibiotics are used everywhere and by everyone. But as with the genie in the lamp, it turns out that there's a catch. If you watched the movie Aladdin, you saw that the genie explained to Aladdin the rules behind the wishes and further clarified that only three wishes would be granted. After these three wishes were used up, so to speak, the magic was exhausted. A parallel situation exists with antibiotics in that they too can lose their magic. Why? Well, antibiotics are natural products. They're produced by microorganisms. And in nature, microorganisms produce antibiotics to fend off other microorganisms. When Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, he did so through the observation that a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus did not grow around a mold called penicillium species. As natural products, unfortunately, it's also natural that resistance can emerge. This happens through spontaneous mutation of bacterial chromosomes or acquisition of new genetic material through genetic exchange. Selection of resistance is natural but it is greatly accelerated by the use of antibiotics. In the laboratory, I or my team can take a bacterium and an antibiotic and put them together and pretty readily select for mutational antimicrobial resistance. This means that, like the genie's wishes, the activity of many antibiotics is not guaranteed in perpetuity if we use these antibiotics. We need to use antibiotics, but we need to use them when we truly need them. Unfortunately, unlike the situation with the genie and the lamp and the wishes, no one explained to us the rules behind these wishes. And now the world has not been prepared for what has happened with antibiotics. That is the global crisis in antimicrobial resistance. So how did we get to this point? Well, we doctors, and I'm a physician, have overprescribed, and in some cases even today, continue to overprescribe antibiotics. Why would we do this? Well, not with malicious intent. In fact, we are trained to specifically first do no harm, primum non nocere. But because antibiotics work so well, they're miracle drugs, as I mentioned, and because we thought there would be little downside and only potential upside to using them, they've become widely prescribed. Even sometimes when we don't know for sure whether a patient has a bacterial infection, we prescribe antibiotics. Why? Just in case they do. FOMO, so to speak. And our patients have learned that this is the way that antibiotics are given. Taking antibiotics has become almost expected for any type of infection. Sure. We knew, at least academically, about the possibility of resistance to antibiotics. As far back as 1945, Fleming warned, after winning the Nobel Prize for his part in the discovery of penicillin, that 
overuse of penicillin might lead to bacteria resistant to its effects. But as physicians, even when we did observe resistance, we had a solution. Just get a new lamp, a new genie, and a whole new set of wishes. That is, we could rely on the development of new antibiotics. Between the 1950s and uh, about the 1990s, pharmaceutical companies delivered new lamps, new genies, new wishes. But then, that slowed down because the business side of developing new antibiotics was not paying off. The reason? Resistance. Why invest in a new drug if it would rapidly become ineffective? When I was tra in training, I did research on a type of resistant bacteria called vancomycin-resistant enterococci, trying to understand how they had developed, how they were spreading, and how they were resistant to the antibiotics of the time. We didn't have any treatment for these bacteria, and that was actually a big reason for me to go into research in antimicrobial resistance, because I really couldn't handle telling my patients that we didn't have any treatment for them. But then in the year 2000, a new antibiotic was approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration, and it was active against vancomycin-resistant enterococci. And I breathed a sigh of relief, finally a treatment for these devastating infections. However, the very next year at my institution, we had an outbreak of vancomycin-resistant enterococci resistant to this new antibiotic. This gave me a chance to publish in a premier medical journal but overall, it was a disappointing, though not unexpected, turn of events. And I can tell you that this has happened over and over again with different kinds of bacteria, different kinds of antibiotics, and different kinds of resistance. So it's a challenge. So back to the lamp and the genie. We need new antibiotics, obviously. Unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry has progressively become less engaged in developing them at the very time humanity needs them. But how bad is resistance, really? In a study published in The Lancet, it was estimated that in the year 2019, there were 1.3 million deaths globally that were attributable to antibacterial resistance. And it's projected that that number will increase to 10 million deaths annually globally by the year 2050 if nothing is done. This predicted number of deaths comes with a huge economic price tag, an estimated 100 trillion or more in 2050. And just for perspective, that would be about 1% of the global GDP. Antimicrobial resistance creates more expensive patient care, and it also leads to loss of productivity for our patients as well as caregivers. The WHO lists antimicrobial resistance as a top 10 public health threat facing humanity, and the United Nations General Assembly will convene a high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance in New York City this September. It's a problem. So what can we do? Well, first, we must recognize that antimicrobial resistance is here, and I'm sorry to say, it will not go away. We've accelerated the emergence of resistance, and as much as we can, we need to decelerate it. We've used up two of the genie's three wishes, and we need to save that last one for when we really need it. So how can we do this? Well, unlike the genie and the lamp, bacteria are invisible to our eyes. And antimicrobial resistance, as I mentioned, is natural as well as incremental. This leads to resistance being underappreciated. Efforts to combat it are vulnerable to deprioritization due to other emergent and existential threats current policies are falling short. We need to responsibly use the antibiotics that we have in humans, animals, and agriculture, and not burn through those genie's wishes, leaving us empty-handed. The Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria, or PACCARB, of which I'm honored to be a voting member, just published a report titled A United Front Collaborative Global Leadership to Combat Antimicrobial Resistance. Four global priorities are proposed. The first is to prevent infection. Preventing bacterial, viral, and fungal infections will combat resistance on multiple fronts, 
reducing the need for treatment, and reducing the spread of drug-resistant pathogens. Interventions include improved infection prevention, access to clean water, hygiene, and sanitation, and vaccination. The second priority is development of products to combat antimicrobial resistance. I already spoke about the need for new antibiotics, that's clear, but diagnostics also play a key role. They identify those who need antibiotics and those who don't need antibiotics. And for those who need antibiotics, they tell us which antibiotic will work and which antibiotic will fail because of resistance. And vaccines address antimicrobial resistance as well. New mechanisms to support product development are needed. Public-private partnerships and market-based incentives that reward innovation are crucial to create a sustainable pipeline. The third priority is access to antibiotics, diagnostics, and vaccines. Many places, especially low- and middle-income countries, suffer from limited access. And the final priority is awareness, cultivating a basic understanding of the global threat that is posed by resistance among professionals like you, the public, as well as political leaders is necessary for meaningful action. I hope that this presentation will help with that in some small way. And speaking of awareness among political leaders, the American Society for Microbiology, or ASM, recently published a document titled Policy Pathways to Combat the Global Crisis of Antimicrobial Resistance. ASM identified areas where policies should be strengthened to save lives. ASM's recommendations are to support innovative research into antimicrobial resistance, to champion solutions to the challenging antimicrobial marketplace, to improve rapid detection of resistance, to foster stewardship models for antimicrobial prescribing such that the right person, animal, or crop get the right drug for the right infection at the right time, and to harmonize domestic and global policy frameworks to bolster antimicrobial stewardship and increase laboratory capacity in low- and middle-income countries. All of us need to appreciate the problem of antimicrobial resistance. We need to prevent the emergence of resistance where possible, and we need to recognize that the use of antimicrobial agents selects more resistance, so their use should be restricted to situations where they're needed. Antibiotics are like wishes delivered by a genie from a lamp. We can only use them a finite number of times before that magic runs out because of resistance. Understanding the rules behind these wishes provides a tool to use antibiotics wisely, just like we've learned to do with other exhaustible resources such as energy and water. Thank you for your attention.